and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that help them become more real for us so that we can gain more power out of them. I'm your host, Kerry Mulestein, and this is a short cast where it will be just me uh, talking about John chapter 11. And I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time. It really will be shorter, I think. Uh, there will be lots of people who cover this, uh, lots of other podcasts who cover this in, in a, a more full way going through everything and uh, uh, we're just going to let them do that uh, but we're going to focus on uh, especially a theme that uh, we've been developing which is that the how to the, the elements that make it so that people recognize that Jesus is the Messiah and so on um, and uh, just a couple of other things so We'll, we'll just breeze over the first part of chapter 11, which is that uh, the Savior seems to intentionally wait to go to Bethany until Lazarus has both died and has been dead for a while. Uh, and I think it's because of the things that we're going to talk about as we go along. He, he wants this to be that kind of sign. So remember that John uses the word for miracles that it's not dynamis but uh, that it's a great work but the the word that means a sign these are signs of who he is and we've got these this these stories of miracles that, you know he carefully selects which miracles he's going to share uh, and this being probably the the capstone miracle besides the miracle of his own resurrection um this being the the capstone uh miracle so we're going to jump down to verse 17 we're in john chapter 11 verse 17 then when jesus came that's to bethany where mary martha and lazarus lived he found that he uh that being lazarus so he found that lazarus had lain in the grave four days already now this is significant um because the idea is that uh the the body may or the spirit may hang around for three days but by four days uh that's that's the body's moved on or the spirits moved on and the notion or really the thing is uh, that that part's a little bit fuzzy that's pretty commonly accepted and I, I think it's correct but uh but what's clear is that no one has ever raised someone from the dead who has been dead this long so you'll remember that in John chapter 9 he has done a miracle that no one had done, which is to heal someone that had been born blind. So let's keep in mind, we've talked about this before, but let's keep in mind that people have constantly been judging him by the great miracle working prophets, which would be Elijah and Elisha, who have control over the elements, who multiply food, uh, who heal people, who raise people from the dead, including, as I think I mentioned before, that the Savior raises the, the widow of Nain, uh, or he raises her son from the dead. It's on the same hill that just to go around the corner of the hill and you have the Shunammite woman whose son is raised from the dead by Elisha. Uh, he's been intentionally uh, doing these miracles, at both out of compassion, but also, I think, as signs of who he is. And people recognize that he is a great prophet. And we've even heard recently they're saying when, when Christ comes or when the Messiah comes, will he do greater miracles than these? But then he exceeds Elisha and Elijah in healing the man that was born blind. And that takes us to a new level of it's difficult to accept him as anything but the Messiah. Now let's continue on with this story. Um, so he's been dead four days and Bethany's nigh into Jerusalem and many of the Jews are, are there to comfort, right? There's a lot of people there. There's mourning and then a lot of people there. Verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then and I love that in some ways Martha is the the highlight of this story, whereas the last one it was probably Mary, but but in this story it's Martha. Um, then uh, then said Martha unto Jesus, now listen to her faith. This is so powerful the faith that she has. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. She has absolute full faith that Christ could have healed him, but that's not all. Listen to the next verse. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. She believes that if he thinks it's the right thing, he can do an unprecedented miracle. He can do something that no one has ever done, not even himself at this point. She fully believes that. That is incredible faith. Verse 23, Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. And you can... I could, if I put myself in 
uh, and this is part of what makes it become very real to me. If I put myself in Martha's case, I, I know I would be like, okay, is he saying he will raise him again? Or is he teaching me something else? I want to believe, but I don't want to get my hopes up if he's saying something else. And sure enough, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So I think that's her saying, okay, yeah, is that what you're saying? I know he'll be resurrected. Is that what you're saying or is it something else? Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. That is so important because he is, in fact, the resurrection. There is no resurrection without Christ resurrecting himself. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, that means, I, th I think, in a, a hundred different ways. In all the different ways we can be dead, we will live again. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now, I think that that's going to sound like he's talking about resurrection, and in some ways he is. I think more and beyond resurrection, but but certainly resurrection. Listen to her and her recognition of who he is. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So we've talked about these levels of knowing. It's one thing to believe he's a good, good man, a great teacher, a prophet, a great prophet, Messiah, Son of God. She is all the way to that place. Right. It's fantastic. And that's where we need to be as well. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, saying uh, secretly, saying, the master's come and call for thee. So we've missed something in there where there's an, more of an exchange between Jesus and Martha. And part of it is go get Mary. But my guess is there's more than that. Um, and as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Now, Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in her house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth up to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. The same faith and, and thing that Martha went through. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, there are all sorts of people who have all sorts of different ideas about what he's troubled about. Um, is it because they're moaning? Is it because they're, you know, and, and mourning? Is it because they don't have enough faith? I, I think it's about what the pain that they're feeling. And, and I'll explain why I think that in a second. And he said, where have you laid him? They said in him, Lord, come and see. Then we get actually the shortest verse in scripture. This is a good one to memorize if you need to memorize the scripture. John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. But I want to spend a, a bit of time on that. Uh, I have to say that sometimes I struggle. I, I think I'm a very sympathetic and empathetic person, but sometimes I struggle with this because when I know uh, especially when my kids were young and they're crying over something that I know yeah, this doesn't matter. And in five minutes, you won't remember and you won't care. I, sometimes I have a hard time taking their sadness at the moment seriously. I'm just like, hey, get over it, move on. Um, and sometimes we do just need to get over it and move on. But even so, we need to recognize the pain that people are feeling at the moment. Jesus has no reason to weep other than because of the pain they're going through. He knows that in a moment, they're going to have wild, ecstatic joy. Uh, I, I, if it were me and I knew this is what was going to happen, I'd be just like, ah, huh, you're crying. You don't need to cry. Just stop crying. Don't feel bad because it's going to be this way, right? And my children can attest to me saying, don't don't feel bad. Don't worry about it, right? That's, that's the kind of thing that comes out of my mouth most often. But Jesus wept. He felt their pain. He is going to make them happy, but he felt their their pain uh, and empathized with them. And I think th that's why he's troubled. I don't know. Maybe there's other things. But anyway, and people recognized, behold, how he loved them. And some of them said, couldn't he have opened the eye or could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? So people understand who th that he has that power. Jesus, again, groaning in himself, coming to the grave. It's a cave and a stone lay on it. And he says, take away the stone. Uh, and, and she says, I love this, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he's been dead four days, and probably true. Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou should see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, notice how, again, we get this in John, 
Uh, he is turning glory to the Father. In fact, if we were to go back up to verse 4, when Jesus heard that Nazareth is sick, he said, this sickness is not unto death. Even though he knows he's going to die, he says it's not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son might be glorified thereby. He knows that this is going to be a sign as to who he really is, and that that will add glory to God. So he is, again, pointing things towards God, even though he recognizes what this will do about how people see him. He's pointing things towards God, and he does it in his prayer. I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So do you see what he's saying? I'm praying this. I don't have to pray it. I always have known that you heard me and you know that I know you've heard me and you know I'm grateful for it. I'm praying this specifically so that everyone around me knows that I know that this comes from you, that this power that I am about to demonstrate is not my power, but it's your power. So they will know not about how wonderful I am, but that I am your servant sent from you. That is something we all need to emulate. Really, truly, we all need to emulate that. He sets the example for us. Verse 43, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto them, loose him and let him go. Uh, and then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. How, how can you not? Right? He has done something beyond what anyone has ever done. But some run to the Pharisees, and they tell them, and then the chief priests and the Pharisees hold a council. Uh, what do we do for this man do with many miracles? You see the place they are in? They know. So for various reasons, they are determined that, that people should not accept him as a Christ. If there is a power struggle, some of them are afraid of what Rome will do, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, there are many reasons, and their problem is, how can people not accept him as Christ when he is now for the second time very publicly done miracles that no one has done before? And especially this one is so beyond what anyone has done before. It's almost inescapable. You have to believe he is greater than the greatest prophets. And that only gives you one position. He's the Messiah. Right now, whether they they don't typically understand Messiah means Son of God, where where there are few people who have come to that realization. I think most have not, and even those who have still don't fully understand what that means. I would say, but but they have this problem. If we let him thus alone, so this is verse forty eight. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. You see, they know we can't stop this. We cannot stop um, where this is going. Uh, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. So people will believe as the Messiah, and they think that will cause a rebellion, and the Romans will destroy them. Uh, that, if he were that kind of Messiah, that would probably be a, a reasonable conclusion. One of them named Caiaphas, the high priest, says, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one sh man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And John says, and this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Now, John seems to know someone that's on the inside. Maybe it's Nicodemus. I don't know who it is. Uh, we'll see that, that that allows John to get into the trial. Um, he's able to know the name of the servant of the high priest uh, who has his ear cut off. John seems to know some inside information, and, and so he seems to know what is said here. But note both how clear it is that they know he's the Messiah uh, or that people will accept him as the Messiah. And, and the next chapter is the triumphal entry, right? And this is where this kind of miracle goes. Uh, it, it, this miracle forces the issue and they decide to kill Jesus because of this miracle. And they want to kill Lazarus as well, because he is way too much proof as to who Jesus really is. And they just can't have that. Uh, and notice that it is the chief priests and the Pharisees who do the council, and it is the chief priest himself who says he has to die. Uh, and John says he doesn't recognize how prophetic this is, that one man has to die so that they can all be saved, but not in the way that that man, the high priest Caiaphas, was thinking. So I want to highlight these themes that we've seen, Christ turning attention to the Father, Christ's miracles bearing witness of who he is, that he is sent from the Father, and that people come to recognize he is beyond a prophet and that this is what leads 
him to his death. Uh, those are all important things as we understand this story. And my only hope is that, well, it's not my only hope, but what I hope, one of the things I hope comes from this is that we ourselves will be determined to recognize that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and to believe that all things are possible with him, both the resurrection and the life and every other miracle, as President Nelson has said, pray for and expect miracles. Uh, believe in Christ and who he is and that he does the Father's will and that he is here to bless us in accordance with the Father's will. I believe in those things and we'll be in a good place. And I testify of those things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.